Hello everyone, welcome to our fifth lab. Uh, this is the second week of cardiovascular system. I need to grab something here real quick. I forgot to get everything but my red pen I'm going to need. Okay, so what we're going to be starting with today is uh, looking at our blood vessels. There will be two parts to this. We'll have our arteries this week, veins next week. Uh, so as we're thinking about this, um, we're going to be discussing that these are the tubes, the miles of blood vessels uh, that carry all the blood throughout the body. Now, there are some different examples of these I want to talk about, and this will be more in-depth in Chapter 21, but we'll see the arteries, veins, arterioles, venules, and capillaries. So what you're going to see is that arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Arteries always away from heart. This is the blood away from the heart. Veins always come to the heart, so they always return to the heart. And remember, we had two basic circulations. We had our pulmonary circulation, and if we remind ourselves of that, uh, I um, now I kind of wish I had grabbed this real fast before, but I've still got it. So I save every drawing that I do. So um, if you guys still have this, uh, uh, then you can actually see the distinctive differences here. Uh, that remember, veins towards the heart, arteries away from heart. You will see that um, the uh, systemic circulation comes to the right atrium, leaves out the right ventricle. I mean, uh, sorry, blood leaves there and goes to the lungs, uh, but it's the uh, left ventricle that pumps blood out to the body. So it includes the right atrium and the left ventricle would be the two parts of the heart that are involved in systemic circulation, receiving blood through the right atrium and pumping blood out to the body through the left ventricle. And the pulmonary circulation, remember, is receiving blood at the left atrium and pumping blood out to the lungs uh, via the right ventricle. So each um, of the ventricles and each of the atria uh, play a role into each of the circuits. And I will expect you to know which ones do which part. So as we are able to trace that blood, what we're going to look at, and you can see pulmonary and systemic, Basically, think of the systemic circulation, uh, think of uh, the cardiac circulation as being a component of that. Uh, the coronary arteries and veins are a subsection of the systemic circulation. They are almost like a, a subdivision of that because the heart is part of the cardiovascular system. Okay, now the aorta is where we're going to begin our, our, our kind of journey here. We're going to begin with the aorta. Remember the aorta comes off of your, uh, comes out of your left ventricle and that is the major artery that pumps blood out. Now there is an ascending aorta and a de descending aorta. The ascending aorta as it comes up forms the arch of the aorta. The arch of the aorta has three vessels that we talked about. Uh, we said there was a brachiocephalic trunk that is also referred to as a nominate or no-name artery. Then we're going to see the left common carotid and the left subclavian. So to remember the branches of the aortic arch, think of the ABCs. This is easy as your ABCs. A, aortic arch. B, brachiocephalic trunk. C, left common carotid. S, ABCs left subclavian. So what we're thinking of is the ABCs. Your A, B, C's. The arch gives off the brachiocephalic trunk. The left common carotid and the left subclavian arteries. So these are your ABCs. So the arch gives off brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, and left subclavian. Now the brachiocephalic trunk tells me two things about it. So if we were to take the brachiocephalic trunk, it tells me 
that it gives blood to head and arm. So that means there is a carotid, which is the right carotid artery, and the right subclavian that comes off of that. Because remember, in anatomy, I don't use words I don't need. If there is a left subclavian and a left common carotid, there must be a right subclavian and a right common carotid. And the right subclavian and right common carotid arteries come off the brachiocephalic trunk as it further divides. So what you're going to see is that your brachiocephalic trunk gives rise to the right subclavian. That serves blood to the upper thoracic, in this case here, and that's going to ultimately go down into the arm. The right common carotid serves neck and head on the right side. The left common carotid, neck and head on the left side, and the left subclavian, the left upper thoracic, which will ultimately go down into your arms. Now the descending aorta has two subdivisions. That's the other half of the aorta, the thoracic aorta and abdominal aorta. As long as it's in the chest, as soon as it hits the diaphragm and goes down, it becomes the abdominal aorta. It's in the chest, thoracic, it's in the abdomen, it's the abdominal aorta. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Now, as you can see, so diagrammatically, and these diagrams will be on your exam. Uh, these will be blank diagrams that I will use, just like how I use some diagrams on the senses, like the uh, uh, lacrimal apparatus or the parts of the inner ear or the... Uh, or the uh, rods and cones, etc. Uh, I'm going to use these as diagrams. So they'll be blank versions and I'll show you guys at the end of that. Now, as we go through this, remember we have a, a ABCs. You have the arch. The arch gives rise to the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid, and left subclavian arteries. The brachiocephalic trunk further branches into brachial which is the right subclavian, which goes down to the arm ultimately, and cephalic head, right common carotid. Right common carotid, left common carotid, left subclavian. A, B, A, C, A, arch, B, C's, okay? Now remember, there is a thoracic aorta and an abdominal aorta. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The diaphragm will be your frame of reference. If you're below the diaphragm, you're abdominal. If you're above the diaphragm in your aorta, you're thoracic. Ascending aorta, arch, descending aorta. All right, now in the head, we're going to talk about first, we're going to go through our first list, is we're going to go from common to vertebral. Then we're going to talk about the circle of Willis, and then we'll come back and... Uh, so I'm going to do this in two parts, this one slide. So we're going to look at, in the head and neck, we're going to see our common carotid arteries. Now when you hear the word common, and I keep wanting to do this every time uh, for future reference, and I'm going to go ahead and do it now that I can do this, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and do it. Because every time I think about it, I'm teaching and I can never do it. I want to make sure to emphasize a point here. And so I know people complain that I'm doing this, but I can because I'm actually saving it to the computer. And I wanted to make sure that I was uh, doing this for future classes. Is that the, when you hear the word common, I want you to be thinking that it has something in common, that it's going to branch. While this attempts to try to save... So if something has something in common, what's going to happen is it will branch like a tree. Think about a tree as it branches out to form a big tree here that it had all these things in common. So there was a common trunk and then branches. Well, we have a common trunk and then branches. And that's what we're going to be thinking of here when we deal with this, okay? So what you guys are going to see is the common carotid arteries branch off into the internal and external carotids. Internal carotids are going to get the brain. External carotids are going to get the face. Now primarily, most of this is coming off external carotids. Facial arteries, maxillary arteries, superficial temporal arteries, basilar and vertebral. Now let's take a look at this. As we said, here we have brachiocephalic trunk, ABCs. 
Aortic arch gives off a brachiocephalic that becomes a right common carotid artery and right subclavian artery. Now, after we get to this common carotid, it is the same on both sides. There's no difference. Now, not every single human being out there will have a brachiocephalic trunk. There are anatomical anomalies. But, once we get to the common, we should be pretty consistent. And the common carotid arteries bifurcate into an external carotid artery to supply blood mostly to the face and head, whereas the internal goes up to supply blood to the brain. Now, the external carotid arteries, we're going to see, branch off to become the facial, the maxillary, and superficial temporal. So, EFMS. EFMS is one way we can remember these main branches that we have to know is EFMS. EFMS. The external carotid, external carotid artery gives off facial, maxillary, and superficial, temporal. Sorry, my handwriting is very poor. I'm trying to look at a screen and write at the same time. It's not working very well for me. Okay, so uh, EFMS. <clears throat> now, the uh, other vessels we want to pay attention to is the vertebral arteries passing here through the transverse processes of the, tra the transverse foramen and the cervical vertebrae as it goes in the back to also help supply blood to the brain. Now, there are other arteries that the body has that come off the external carotid, but these guys here, and I always keep wanting to do this as well, is uh, the EFMS. These all come off of that, and I've always thought about making this a thing that I do in the pat in, uh, for future classes that I just never done. So I, I think this helps make it more organized. And if I don't do it now, honestly, um, when I edit these, I don't, I'm not thinking about it in the way that I'm teaching it. I'm thinking about it differently. So I apologize for making those edits. But EFMS, external carotid, uh, gives rise to your facial, maxillary, and superficial temporal. That helps to kind of identify things if you have that. Okay. Now, the other big thing we want to turn our attention to is uh, the basilar, which we'll see in a moment, uh, and then the circle of Willis. The circle of Willis, or the cerebral arterial circle, the internal carotid artery comes in, and it forms a circle. The internal carotid arteries will come off. There will be an anterior and posterior cerebral, and the anterior and posterior communicating arteries will form a circle. Now, so the anterior cerebral, posterior cerebral, anterior and posterior communicating arteries will all come in with the circle of Willis. And then we're going to see our middle cerebral, though not part of the circle of Willis, will be associated. We're also going to see vertebral arteries and basilar arteries. Okay? Or the, uh, uh, we'll see the basilar. Uh, the basilar artery, a, uh, the... Uh, usually not going to be an actual pair of arteries, uh, how the structure sheets tend to make it look. Uh, it's generally going to be singular. There, there can be some branching. But what we're going to do to learn this is let me help you guys. We're going to draw it out. And we're going to start off by drawing a circle. And what we're going to do is make a cowboy. Now this cowboy wears a hat. So we got to have our cowboy hat. So we're going to have the brim of the cowboy hat coming out like that. Then we're going to have the top of the cowboy hat coming up like this. Okay. So we got him. We got our cowboy with his cowboy hat on. Now cow, this cowboy is kind of slim, slim. He's kind of skinny. And his arms are going to be drooping down to try to go for his pistols. And then he's going to be bow-legged from riding on a horse all the time. So he's a little bow-legged cowboy. So we're going to make him very bow-legged. And this is our cowboy. We're going to name this cowboy Willis because that's 
that's a good name for a cowboy, isn't it? Is Willis. So Willis, our cowboy here, um, remember the circle of Willis is made up of four vessels. One of these vessels here is the anterior cerebral arteries. Now, anterior cerebral arteries, if there's anterior cerebral, there must be posterior cerebral arteries. Okay, so that is half of our circle done. And this circle, imagine that the arms all kind of connect this bottom together. Now, there are two ways that a cowboy communicates. One of those ways he might do is raise his hat up like, ma'am. They might communicate with their hat or bend their hat down or put their hat, cover up their icy stare. So their hat is used to communicate. Well, the top of his hat right here that bridges this. This is his anterior communicating artery. Now the other thing he might do is use his face like you can tell he's not happy with you. This would be the posterior communicating artery. Now, this is all very important with stroke patients. Then let me kind of give you a, a why, what if, and then I need to put one vessel in here, but I was going to steal one of my pins here. So, one vessel I am going to add to this is this dot represents the internal carotid artery. So now we have our five vessels, our four vessels that come off uh, fed by the internal carotid arteries here coming in. Now, what I want to show you is what if there was a blockage here? What if right here we had a blood clot? Well, let's say this was a clot. This clot here and blood tries to come in and go through that. It can't make it through that clot, but it can go around. Blood can go around and get there. So we have a way around clots and we minimize the risk of clots to supply blood to the brain. That's why we have the circle of Willis. So circle of Willis is very anatomically important in terms of reducing blood clots and their impact on the brain because brain is very crucial. Now the other components we want to talk about that are non-things that I've drawn here in my cowboy, we're going to label our middle cerebral artery okay we're going to label his skinny body and that's the basilar artery then we're going to label his bow legs and those are the vertebral arteries there are two of them and so blood can come up through here and go in and get around blood can come in here through the internal carotids so where his hat bill fits, that's your internal carotids, top of his hat, so this is all a uh, hollow space here. So the anterior cerebrals, the top of the hat here, the uh, part of his 10 gallon hat sticking up where his head is at, the top of the hat, that's anterior communicating, posterior communicating, posterior cerebral, basilar, and vertebrals. Okay. So if you can draw the circle of Willis, it's really going to help you guys in making identification of it on a diagram. And let's take a look at that. So as you can see, I'm going to zoom in now. So we see, see here, these are the internal carotids, not labeled on this diagram, but these are internal carotids. And the internal carotid arteries, we have anterior cerebral arteries going up, anterior cerebral anterior cerebral, anterior communicating, posterior cerebral, posterior communicating, middle cerebrals, uh, basilar, and vertebrals. 
And there are other vessels associated with this. Now, they are found around the optic chiasm and the pituitary gland is what they're found near. For example, it is very common for an anterior cerebral aneurysm to cause issues with smell and vision. Um, so this is another reason if it's compressing these nerves nearby here, it can mess up the optic pathway or even compress the optic nerve or the olfactory nerve as well, causing vision and olfactory issues. So this could become a problem. So if you understand these anatomical relationships, you'll better understand pathophysiology. Okay. Now, um, for a lot of the students, uh, I've made these little like flow charts to help you kind of find your way through. I'm not going to ask you blood is here, where does it go next in the blood vessels. That would be for a 4,000 level course. Uh, but this is there to help you find your way if you get lost in especially this diagram. Now as we look at the upper limb, what we want to do in the upper limb is uh, let's look at that and what I'm going to do here in the upper limb is uh, one of the things I wanted to do is let's draw a very rudimentary arm two three four okay one two three four five there we go <clears throat> there we go it's so an arm I know not very good but that's okay okay so it's supposed to be our digits here. This is our arm. Here is our armpit. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is if we come in to the armpit, there's a vessel here called the axillary artery. Now, it got here from a subclavian. Now, once it passes out of the axilla, actually the teres major muscle, when it crosses it, it gets a name change. And it is called the brachial artery. Then it gets to your forearm and it bifurcates. Now, there is a side, this is, let's say this is pinky, this is thumb, and my very crude drawing that I tried to do. Then this is medial, this is lateral. Now, the medial vessel of the bifurcation, this is the ulnar artery. This one here, lateral, is the radial artery. Okay? Now, Together, this will form a series of arches called the Palmer arches. There are superficial ones and deep ones. Now, on my examination, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I'm not going to have you label superficial or deep because you won't be able to see it well enough. It will not show up on the uh, diagrams I'm going to use, okay? Now, I will have to uh, make sure you guys know that you're dealing with arteries or veins during this exam because I have to use grayscale. I can't use color. Now, off of these Palmer arches come vessels that enter into your digits, your fingers. And these are called the digital arteries okay so if I had subclavian giving rise to axillary axillary goes into the arm becomes brachial brachial bifurcates laterally become the radial medially become the ulnar forming your superficial and deep palmar arches that give rise to digital arteries then we should have an understanding of that pretty well now what I want to do is make sure you guys can see our uh, vessels here. So, as we learn, the axillary, brachial, radial, ulnar, palmar arches, both superficial and deep and digitals, are all found in your upper limbs. Now, I could be like, which of these are found in the upper limb? I could have a multiple choice question. Which of these are found in the upper limb? Which of these are found in the head and neck? Okay, things like that. Which of these make up the circle of Willis? Okay. So it's things like that you need to pay attention to as well. You need to know that those are in there. 
Now, what we're going to do is if I start off down here, I have ascending aorta, comes up, aortic arch, off the arch of the aorta, brachiocephalic trunk, we give off a right subclavian, we enter the armpit, we're axillary, and we stay axillary. Now, you notice it's not because the tube stops being the same tube, it passes into a different anatomical region. It gets into the axilla, it's called axillary artery. As the very moment, the very moment I pass, this muscle right here is teres major. At the moment I pass through that, I become brachial. And I stay brachial until I bifurcate here, where I become a radial on the lateral side, an ulnar on the medial side. And these unite to form deep and superficial palmar arches. Now, I will not tag the superficial and deep palmar arches on the exam because you won't be able to tell really which one is superficial or deep on a small image on a piece of paper so I'm not going to be do tagging those and the digital arteries are what goes on the supply of blood to the, fing the fingers excuse me I just had lunch now I got the hiccups I had to eat my lunch a little early okay and again these help you find your way around now we're going to be in the thorax trunk and abdomen thorax and abdomen or the trunk Remember, there are two divisions of the aorta that are found in the descending region. Descending aorta has two divisions, thoracic and abdominal. Uh, the one thing we're going to help you guys learn is the thoracic aorta is T5 to T12. You have five fingers, so thoracic aorta. T5 on one hand, now uh, to T12, the end of the thoracic, that's the last thoracic vertebrae, T5 to T12, the end, T5 to T12. And the two that we need to know off of this are the intercostal arteries and the superior phrenic. So let's take a look at them first, and here we have the thoracic aorta's divisions, where I can see the intercostal between the ribs. Intercostals is between ribs. Intercostal between ribs. Superior phrenic, phrenic references the diaphragm. So it supplies blood to the top of the diaphragm. And if we zoom in here, you're gonna see those blood vessels, okay? Now, the abdominal aorta below the diaphragm, uh, here's a mnemonic to help you remember uh, remember most of these, uh, or at least uh, a good number of them, is can soup really good in long cans? Is canned soup really good in long cans? Uh, in uh, standing for inferior mesenteric in long cans, lumbar, so these aren't all of them, but these are big vessels. Is canned soup really good in long cans? And uh, this kind of helps you get a lot of them, not all of them, okay? Now we'll see the inferior phrenic, which is going to supply blood to the bottom of the, di of the diaphragm, celiac trunk, which will bifurcate into three vessels, the left gastric, splenic, and common hepatic. Left gastric supplies blood to the stomach, but it actually supplies to the right side of stomach. You're like, that don't make any sense. Uh, there is a right gastric that supplies blood further on the right side of the stomach than the left gastric does, even though the left gastric is on the right side of the stomach. Stomach is more on the left, so it's, it's weird. Okay. Now, splenic artery supplies blood to spleen, common hepatic supplies blood to liver. So those will be it. the one that's associated to the stomach, left gastric, one of the spleens, the splenic, one on the liver is hepatic, common hepatic. Now, the superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric supply, they go to the mesenteries that hold your guts together, your intestines. So that's where they're going is into the intestines. The adrenal arteries supply blood to the adrenal glands, easy to find those. Renal arteries supply blood to the kidneys. Gonadal arteries, so the gonads. In males, we call them testicular arteries. In females, we call them ovarian arteries. The lumbar arteries to the lower back, lumbar region. 
common iliac. When you hear the word common, remember, what do they have in common? It splits into an internal and external iliac arteries. Common, the two branches, internal and external. Okay, so let's take a look at these. Now, we're going to start at the top. Is canned soup really good in long cans? Is inferior phrenic canned celiac tr trunk soup superior mesenteric really renal good gonadal good in inferior mesenteric long lumbar cans common iliac artery so that helps you kind of get most of these in order okay is canned soup really good in long cans? Now, let's fill in the rest. Okay, so the adrenal artery supplies blood to the adrenal glands, as you can see here and here. The renals, of course, are the kidneys. The gonadals have been cut off. They would go down here and here to the gonads. In a male, they're down here. In the female, they're down inside the pelvic basket. So they have to go down to where they were. The gonads were down up here during development. Right around here is where they were in this line. And they descended downwards during development. Lumbar, supplying blood to the lumbar vertebrae, etc. There's actually one, two, three of them. Here's lumbars, there's lumbars, there's lumbars. Now, the thing that we always want to think of is common branches. Common iliac, right and left. Internal iliac, external iliac. Is canned soup, I mean, sorry, soup, really good in long cans? Okay. That helps you get that. Now, celiac trunk. The celiac trunk bifurcate into a left gastric. As you can see, though, this is right side of the stomach. Well, the, uh, the uh, left, right gastric is actually here. Uh, and it's produced off of this. It's a branch off the common hepatic going down the looping up. Which is something you will learn if you take human anatomy, the advanced anatomy. The splenic goes to supply blood to spleen. And the common hepatic supplies blood to liver. There's a left and right hepatic. So that's why it's called common hepatic. Uh, and some to the stomach as well. So common hepatic. Okay. Celiac trunk. Celiac trunk has nothing to do with celiac disease. It just means belly. So this is the belly artery. Okay. And here I've gone and made a little schematic of the abdominal uh, arteries as well to kind of help you. Uh, sketch these in. You know, uh... I don't have inferior mesentery or inferior, uh, 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 my brain cannot spit out names today. It's, it's, I've had, I've been, I have a, a sinus infection and it's kind of really getting to me. Uh, the <laughs> inferior, uh, 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 why can my brain not spit that out? Give me one second. The inferior phrenic. Sorry, I don't know why my brain wouldn't spit that out. Um, I've been, you know, the, I think the extra 20, uh, the extra hours are really kind of wearing my body down. But anyway, this there is to kind of help you guys out a little bit, help you navigate more. Okay, lower limbs is the hardest part of today. We're going to see our femorals, our deep femorals, popliteal, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, fibular, dorsalis pedis, dorsal arches, plantar arches, and digital arteries. Now, like with the hands, the dorsal and plantar arches I will not tag because you can't tell which level they will be on. It's very difficult on eight and a half by 11 piece of paper which one is superficial and deep, which one is closer to the dorsum or top of the foot, which one is closer to the bottom or plantar surface. Okay, so as we do this, let's follow our common iliac. Common iliac bifurcate into an internal iliac and an external iliac. External iliac comes down in the leg and it's still the same tube. It just gets called in the thigh femoral. 
off the femoral, a deep femoral bifurcates to get to the back of the thigh, inside of the thigh, back of the leg. Back of the thigh there. Femoral continues on down and goes behind the leg. And as femoral goes behind the leg to the underneath, it changes its name as it gets to the intercondylar fossa or popliteal fossa of the femur called the popliteal artery. And the popliteal artery will continue on down until it bifurcates here. Once it bifurcates here, its name will change. Now, there is a bifurcation here. The anterior tibial comes off, passes between the tibia and the fibula, and goes to the front of the leg. But when the second branch, the fibular artery, comes off, we now call this the posterior tibial. Anterior tibial, posterior tibial. Okay. And you can see the anterior tibial coming in between the legs and passing on the front, and it becomes an artery here at the front of the ankle called dorsalis pedis. Now the dorsal venous arches will be near the top of the foot, or dorsal ar arteries, not venous arches, I apologize, uh, arteries. These are referred to as dorsal because they're on the top of the foot where plantar near the bottom of the foot. But they give off digital arteries in the toes. Now the hardest thing to get, anterior tibial, fibular posterior tibial, anterior tibial, fibular posterior tibial, anterior tibial, fibular posterior tibial. Those are the hardest ones to get. What you're going to want to do to make sure you get these and understand them well is to not only do the study guide at the end, but practice these blank diagrams. I left the lines on on purpose. I had some students say that they preferred it that way. And practice these. Label them on and on. What I'm going to tell you to do is if you haven't gotten them, and I should have some here uh, still in one of my bags. Uh, here they are. And if you need them, come by and get them. I'll be glad to give you this pack. They're just sitting in here. I inherited them. I never use them, and nobody has ever come and asked for them, but I have them. You are welcome to come to my office, and I will give these this pack to you. What I urge is to get these sheet protectors. And what you do is take these blank pictures, put them in it. And if you slide them in it, uh, for example, uh, get yourself a, uh, the finer tip um, whiteboard markers. If I can get that to go in there, it's my uh, my fingers are very dry today. And you put that in with your blank diagram. Now this is a great study method. Uh, these are cheap. You can buy them uh, pretty inexpensively. So you have your diagram in there. And what you do, I should have in here some markers that I could use. Let me just use a standard Expo dry erase. And you go in and you say radial artery and you label it and you're like wipe it off do it again and practice them like that and all you have to do you get a little pack of dry erase markers at Walmart pack of these put your blank diagrams in practice labeling it is a high impact process that does a lot of good in helping you. And like I said, if you, I got 50 of these, and I will give them to you. Whomever comes by and asks for them, I'll give them to you. Nobody's ever taken me up on it, but some of my best students do this, and this is how they are the most successful in this lab exam. Okay, this is the hardest lab exam by far. And the arteries are the hardest part of it and veins. Arteries and veins. The blood vessels is the hardest part for most students. Now, I, I am going to require you to know every blood vessel. Uh, this is what I require for all my classes, and I always have. Um, and I, I'm not going to curtail because just because it's hard. 
but I'm going to let you know it is the hardest exam we do all semester. You can do this. You guys did very well in that first exam, uh, for the most part, so I have a lot of faith in you. Uh, please take advantage of anything that I give you. Come by. I, I'm, I'm going to leave them here for you. Those are free for any one of you guys to come by and ask for it. I'd be glad to give it to you. All right, guys, thank you so much, and be on the lookout for the veins coming up in just a little while. Thank you, and have a great day.